Well, hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. I'm your host, G. Mark Hardy, and today we're going to be talking about the great I am. No, this is not a religious presentation. This is on identity and access management, which happens to go by the IAM acronym. So, Hopefully you will find this of value to you. I guarantee you you're using one of these solutions already, but this is going to help you look a little bit further into how it works and what's involved and all the different components of that to help you understand maybe you're missing something. Hey, if you're a subscriber to CISO Tradecraft, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up or a five star, whatever it is that they do, because that helps us uh, well, get higher in the ratings and other people find us. If you're not following us, follow us right now, either on your favorite podcast channel or on YouTube. And if you're not following us on LinkedIn, do so there because we have more than podcasts. We have a good high signal, low noise, ready information for you as a CISO or a CISO practitioner who is working on their way up in their career to help you with your journey in your career path. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into Mull IAM. Now, Identity and access management, let me just go ahead and use Gartner's definition, as good as any, is a security and business discipline that includes multiple technologies and business processes to help the right people or machines to access the right assets at the right time for the right reasons while keeping unauthorized access and fraud at bay. Now, Gartner will go on if you take a look and you can find their magic quadrant report. So these are pretty useful in that it lists a lot of the major vendors. Now, it's a pay-to-play, so understand that. So if you're looking at Gartner Magic Quadrants and you don't see your favorite vendor in there, it doesn't mean that they are horrible, that they're so bad that they didn't even score someplace. If you go ahead and get in there, you'll be in one of the quadrants. And today, at least the most recent report from this past year, lists Okta, Microsoft, Ping Identity, Forge Rock, and IBM as the leaders, as the high end, the right, complete vision, ability to execute with CyberArk and Trust and One Identity as challengers. Thales is a visionary, and Oracle and OpenText are niche players. And that's where they stack out. Now, just because something is in high end right doesn't necessarily mean it's a great solution or not a good solution for you. There may, in fact, be a smaller enterprise and you don't need to have 100,000 endpoints. Then, therefore, the ability to execute might not be that important. Or the completeness of vision might include certain capabilities that really aren't a priority for you. And as a result, please don't just look at this marketing to be able to help you say, oh, I want one of those. By the way, if you actually want to download that report directly from Gartner, it's $1,995, which is why you almost always, always, always will find a Gartner Magic Quadrant report available through one of the vendors that, well, let's face it, finished in the high and the right in that Magic Quadrant up in the leader. And so if you poke around a little bit and you just Google Magic Quadrant from Gartner, and look at identity access management, you'll find that. Now, why do we care? Why do we use these stuff? Why is this in our enterprise? Well, just imagine that you're the guardian of your vast digital fortress, and your primary mission is to ensure that authorized individuals and only authorized individuals can access the resources they need while you're going to keep malicious actors at bay. And managing this balance is really what identity and access management, or IAM, is all about. CIM encompasses the policies, the technologies, and the processes that are used to manage and secure user identities and access permissions within an organization. And as your digital landscape evolves, the complexity of managing identities and access grows. Effective IAM is critical for safeguarding sensitive data, complying with regulatory requirements, and maintaining operational efficiency. So let's take a dive first into the I am the identity management part first. And then going to look at a number of different components. Think about where these things are done in your enterprise, how well you do them, and if there's room for improvement. The first one is user registration. Well, that's really your first line of defense. It's really where IAM begins. Think of it as the initial checkpoint in a high security environment. Just as a bouncer would verify the identities of individuals entering a venue, user registration involves gathering and verifying information about new users. Now, what's involved in that? First of all, of course, data collection. You have to gather information such as names, email addresses, phone numbers, and sometimes even the organizational role. And this is the foundation of a user's digital identity. If a person is an employee, that works pretty well because it's going to be a closed system. 
When I was in the military, we used to go ahead and you go to a personnel support detachment, PSD, not sure if they have those anymore in the Navy, but someone would go in there and they would validate you and make sure, for example, if you're going to get a new ID card issued, because the common access cards, the CAC cards will expire every three years. They have digital certs on them. And for reasons that we discussed in another episode, you don't want open-ended digital certs. They'll make sure you are whom you assert to be and not somebody who found an ID card and want to extend it. That's your foundation. Who is this individual? Now, of course, I'm talking about individuals right now, but we're going to talk about other things like service principles in a bit. Of course, once we collect the data, you want to verify it and you want to confirm these names, the email addresses, the phone numbers, and even conduct a background check. This is a little bit more complicated, and in some areas it becomes KYC. Know your customer when you're dealing with financial institutions or exchanges for things such as cryptocurrencies. In the early, early days in the Wild West, there were no identity verification. You just postulate some email address. You can give them a name if you want. You can pick a country if you want. Thank you for VPNs, and in you go. Well, over time, as the financial regulations have started to encompass all of the crypto, then these KYC, know your customer, combined with AML, anti-money laundering, principles then kick into place. But fundamentally, it's your verification. Now, once we have gone ahead and we have collected the data, we've verified it, we know who the individual is, what's the most basic component of making sure that a user can at least initially get into an account? Passwords, right? Now, there's a lot of back and forth on password policies, and the traditional approach has been, oh, we need complexity, uppercase, lowercase, number, special characters. But humans don't remember that very well. It turns out that what we're looking for is more entropy, a larger collection of possible passwords. And this is a defense against what? Brute forcing. Somebody grabs the encrypted password file and tries every possible combination. Well, a brute force is guaranteed to work eventually. Sun might be cold by the time that it is completed, if you have a big enough space, but fundamentally someone's going to be able to eventually get it at the restaurant at the end of the universe. So what should we do? We should enforce some site of requirements for passwords. And having a password of password, or as a little meme goes, uh, I set my password to incorrect. So anytime I get it wrong or forget it, it says your password is incorrect. Yeah, bad idea. But we find then is that the uppercase, lowercase numbers and special characters, which traditionally been around for a long, long time, as I said, was designed to increase entropy, pack more stuff into fewer characters. Characters aren't that expensive anymore. Memory is fairly cheap. And as a result, Microsoft will give you 127 characters, and I recommend that you use pass phrases and have your users use pass phrases. Little girl went to the store to buy some food for her cat. You're not going to crack that with all the computers at NSA if it's just a whole bunch of characters. Doesn't even have to have uppercase. Doesn't have numbers. Doesn't need a special character. Length is greater than strength. I can go through the math with it on it. But essentially, that has been also reflected in the NIST Special Publication 800 Tax 63 Bravo, which essentially recommends not only uh, forcing or not forcing your users to use complexity, but going for length over strength, but also not forcing them to change their passwords on a regular basis. And so this fundamentally has been a source of consternation for a lot, particularly if I use a government website. I just logged in recently and said, oh, you need to update your password. It has to be the scary, big, long, complex thing. And you know, by the way, you have to update it every 90 days. Okay, well, that works and that helps. And I even have MFA on that account, which is the other thing to think about is multi-factor authentication. If you've got effective multi-factor authentication and somebody either brute forces or guesses or shoulder surfs your password and figures out what it is, to a certain extent, you're probably okay. You're not going to have any problems with that. Now, going forward, let's think about what comes next and how are we able to go ahead and manage that effectively? We'll do after we've gone ahead and ensured that we have the best practices in place. We've got password length. The longer, the better. They're not necessarily required to update if you have multi-factor authentication in place is the second element of identity management, which is going to be verifying the user authenticity or what we call identity proofing. Now, this is verifying the user is indeed who they claim to be. 
I had mentioned that a little bit earlier as kind of a KYC, know your customer, but what techniques are involved? Think about what you're using in your organization. Do you do document verification, validating government issued IDs or other official documents, or even optical character recognition, OCR to streamline this? You've heard the press recently about some entities that have had hiring citizens to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, better known as North Korea, getting technology jobs in the U.S., which gives two things. One is it's cash flow for their regime, being able to go ahead and get Western salaries for the work that they're doing, which is a whole lot more than you get paid at home. And of course, that goes to the house, but also potentially access to the technology as well. So this is a potential threat for a lot of countries that are not aligned with DPRK, that there is an active program involved of trying to go ahead and get people hired into companies. So document verification is a good first step. How about biometric? Fingerprints, facial recognitions, retina scans, all those things work great once you've gone ahead and made sure that you've matched that to the individual. Now, if you go through the airport coming back overseas and I have global entry and when I come back in, it used to be you'd get your passport, you'd wait in a long line, someone would take it, they'd hold up your passport, they'd look at the little form you filled out, you know, you didn't visit a farm, you didn't bring things back, okay, fine, good chunk, and off you go. And then later it got to the point where you'd get to the things. I'm also a member of the global entry, as I mentioned, and we would just look in the camera and they go ahead and they put your fingerprints on there, they validate that, they check that against the database. Now you just look in the camera and it says, yeah, go. And when you get to the end of the line where there's somebody there and there's not much of a line usually in that situation, they look at you and said, you know, welcome home, Mr. Artie, because you've already pre-screened and they already know who you are. Now, biometrics is used in other countries. I've seen that in other nations. When I was in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they capture your biometric data. And so you don't always know what's happening. And of course, that creates for you, if you're capturing biometric data, a whole host of compliance requirements. So think carefully before you do so to ensure that you're going to meet those needs. Now, I've also seen things, for example, with the, oh, I forgot my password. Well, prove who you are. Write this phrase on a card and then hold it up in front of the camera with your face on it, and that would potentially work. Now, I don't know what we're going to get with the deep fake AI for this method in the future. I'm sure we're going to read about some exploits, but for now, that seems to work. Now, a common account recovery tool is security questions, and you want to make sure that their answers are not easily guessable. For example, you don't have to use your mother's maiden name or the street you grew up on, or the high school you went to, or your dog's maiden name, or anything that's going to be on Facebook or other social media locations. It's just another password. But attackers know, and security professionals like you should know, that it's often a weaker password than the original one, which might meet all the complexity requirements of uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters. But when you get to the security reset question, what high school did you go to? Yeah, it's pretty much out there. What was your mother's maiden name? Yeah, that's pretty much up there. So use that as a separate type of a password and, and coach your users and don't, in, in fact, ask for that information. Sometimes I've seen them to say, write your own question, write your own answer. But that's an area I think that we can improve on as a profession. Now, there's some trends that are coming out. There's proximity-based MFA, where you could use the trusted signal from Entra ID for device proximity for authentication, meaning what? If I've got a, a phone and typically I'll get an MFA and it's going to come to my phone and then I have to go ahead and read the code or, or scroll through it and get it. In some cases, there's capabilities where you can set up your laptop to go ahead and Bluetooth to the phone, figuring that, hey, you're going to read the phone anyway. You might as well say if the phone is present, it's good enough because an attacker who is someplace else, even if they have their password, is not going to be able to get your phone. Which is interesting because even if they could socially engineer you into giving up, for example, a six character pin, it's still not going to work because they don't have your phone nearby. Also, there are behavioral biometrics and it analyzes user patterns, such as typing speed, mouse movements, looking for, first of all, to catalog who you are and then for anomalies. Now, this has been around for a while. I had a client back in the 1980s that was using this to monitor productivity as well as establish patterns that served as a proxy for identity. The third element of identity management is directory services. Okay, now that we've identified the users, they've given us their name, we've verified that, 
We have to organize and manage that information, and these directory services are a key element of IAM. They function as a central repository for user data permissions, and they go ahead and facilitate efficient access management. So what's going to go into a directory services construct? User organizations. We're going to create a directory service, but we're not just going to add all of our users into a flat type of a set. We could, but it's pretty inefficient. Why not create roles or departments or access levels? And we can do so by creating groups. And, and for example, in Microsoft Azure, I will go ahead and assign licenses based upon membership in groups. Instead of individually assigning licenses, somebody goes into this particular job or role, they get this set of permissions. Pretty straightforward. All the thinking has already been done. You add somebody new to a particular job description or whatever, and you go. Now, it's important to describe what access control should be done for each individual or group because you don't want unauthorized access and you want to maintain the integrity of your systems. And maintaining that integrity is important because you want to have a management framework that can be controlled by a limited number of administrators. You don't want people going in there arbitrarily being able to make modifications to somebody else or just elevate their own privileges because, well, let's face it, people think that, oh, I'm trustworthy, I should have access to everything. Go ahead and make me super user. Go ahead and make me a local administrator. I won't do anything wrong. I believe you, however, comma, with the ability of certain malware to go ahead and take the role of the actual user that's running, which would you feel more comfortable with? Somebody who has a local admin rights or global administrator rights where there's arbitrary code running on their machine or somebody who has very restricted user access, which they can only provide changes to their own data files. They can't even add or update software. Of course, the latter is a little bit safer. And if you have people who say, but don't you trust me? I said, yes, I do. And this is the reason we're implementing this so that in the event that some other malware or something takes your role, we don't have to fire you because of it, because you can't do a whole lot of damage unless you elevate for a very specific task and come back down. So therefore, do regular audits. You want to ensure that your user access rights are correct, they're current and appropriate. I do a manual audit every Monday morning on global administrators. Well, what does Microsoft say your total global administrator limit should be for your enterprise, regardless of size? Five. Five? Yeah, five. But we have a big, I know that. But it turns out that at the global admin level, where you have all the keys, you should really restrict that. Well, guess what? A couple of weeks ago, I found a new one. And it wasn't a person. It was a service principal. And I'll talk about that one in a little bit. This is the advantage of these things is basically one of my IT guys installed some software. It followed the inputs. It says, yeah, give me global admin rights, install this stuff. And then you're supposed to switch it over to a much more limited. And he left it that way. It wasn't because he's not a good IT administrator, sharp guy, but he's not a security professional. This doesn't think the way you and I would think. So be careful about that. And then we want to have data security to ensure that these databases are protected against unauthorized modification or even reading them. So keep them encrypted. Fourth thing we want to think about is identity federation. Federation basically meaning that I can share a proven identity across multiple systems and reduce the friction that a user has when going from one system to the next to the next. And now I don't have to have multiple logins. Once I've been proven with a single sign-on, for example, I could go to other systems and that SSO credential allows me to go ahead and not have to re-log in, re-log in, re-log in. And now what happens is it simplifies the user experience, it'll reduce the password fatigue, and quite honestly, probably increase the satisfaction that users have with their IT systems and the role of security, which is often viewed as someone who is adding friction. We're backing some of that friction out with SSO. Now, there's other ways to do federated identities. I'm not going to get into the technical details, but SAML, which is the Security Assertion Markup Language, or OAuth, Open Authorization, you can use existing creds to access third-party services. And of course, trust relationships are important. If I go ahead and I federate two identities or I could federate a couple instances or a couple other high level places, that means if you're good here, you're good there. We've seen some of those relationships set up in federated identities in the federal government where you can go ahead and use a credential that will work across multiple different websites instead of having a separate cred for each one of them. So if Uncle Sam can get there, maybe you can. And the benefits, of course, our streamlined experience for your users. They don't have to remember multiple passwords and less overhead as well because you don't have to manage all these different things and you're less likely to have errors. 
A fifth element of identity management is credential issuance. How do we actually provide these access keys? You have to generate and manage credentials that the users will need to access them. And these essentially become digital keys rather than physical keys, but they give you access to systems and data. Now, typical credentials have always been something you know, something you have, or something you are, something you know, like a password. It's a basic element. It's part of credentialing. It's usually the first line of defense, but it better not be your last line of defense. Something you have can be a smart card, something that stores authentication information, or something like a YubiKey, which I use for admin work. It's taking a little bit of getting used to, but I've started using it the last few months. And now I carry around a YubiKey with me when I have to log in as an admin, just stick it in there. Use pin protection, by the way, if you're going to use something like that, like a, uh, a, a token like that. And then it requires that physical element to be there. And some place you or someone thing you are, which would be bio biometric. And we talked about retinas, hand geometry, a lot of other things, fingerprints. There's other things as well. Some looking at the vein patterns on your face, different ways are coming out. There's really a fourth type of access credential, which is now widespread available. And that would be where you are. And so you could base that on geolocation. Now, sure, someone can hack an iPhone and they can go ahead and go ahead and pretend they're not where they really are or create some false information. But if you've got GPS data that says where you are, or I am accessing the system from an IP address that is in a restricted area, like an office that you can only get to if you're in the office, you're not going to pick up a Wi-Fi signal from across the street and be in there. At that particular point, that helps as well. But again, we combine these things. When I was in the military, I worked in high security environments where we had at least three of these factors, where I had to have something I had, something I knew, and then something I was. And as a result, those credentials work. So have strong multi-factor authentication. It's orders of magnitude better security from a single to a double. Going to two to three is incremental, but it still makes you feel better and maybe sleep at night. And you want to ensure secure storage of credentials and also ensure that they cannot be cloned or counterfeited easily. That doesn't help you a whole lot. The next element of identity management is profile management, which helps us empower our users. Once we set somebody up, it'd be nice if they were set for life, but that's not how it works. Things change. People's names change. They get married or something happens where they have to go ahead and have a name change. They change jobs, they change roles, they get promoted, they move laterally. Their job title changes, all their preferences, all these things are a requirement of profile management for updating the information as well as adjusting the roles. And if you can make this self-service, you take a lot of the burden off the IT team, the help desk, who would have to handle routine stuff that could be done by the user. Now, you want to have users regularly update their profiles. And they'll get prompted from time to time, or they should. Is this correct? Is your point of contact correct? Is this recovery correct, email correct? Is your name correct? Although that should probably not change a whole lot. And then ensure that only these individuals or their supervisors can make changes to their particular identities. Now, one of the things that we want to talk about, though, is access controls. And I would think that the average person is probably not going to restrict what they have, but they would expand. And so the next element we want to talk about here is role management, defining access rights. It's a critical component. It involves creating and maintaining these roles. And as I said before, rather than do everybody individually, it's really helpful to define a role. If somebody's going to be a help desk operator, or if they're going to be a supervisor, someone's going to work on the factory floor, someone's going to work in finance, someone's going to work in HR, wherever they happen to be, these roles can have very clearly defined parameters of what they can and can't do. And one of the ways we manage that is what's called RBAC, role-based access control. And we'll implement RBAC to manage user access based upon, well, of course, their roles in the organization. It really simplifies access management and will reduce the risk of unauthorized access by ensuring we don't randomly assign something what they should do or something else. Now, that does require you to work out in fine detail exactly what accesses a particular job should have. But once you got that down, they added a new person to the organization in that same job or role, assignment is trivial. You've already got the hard part worked out. Now, here's an interesting idea is how about a role review? See, what we find out is that privileges accrue and accumulate. And they say like friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. Well, so do roles. And we'll find out that they want to ensure, and you should ensure, that your people 
do not increase their roles over time. Now, why would they increase over time? They don't automatically grow. Correct, but you have stale assignments. Somebody is assigned to a task group for a few months. They get extra capabilities, but you forget to take them away. Someone gets promoted to a different job or they're in a different department, but they still have those stale credentials from the old ones. And so privileges can accumulate if they're not reset periodically. Now, in some financial institutions, there is a requirement to take a vacation. You have to be out of the bank for at least a week, once a year. That's it. If you're running a scam or whatever, you can't run the scam. Well, what if somebody shuts it down? Well, then you're going to see your profitability go up and you're like, hey, soon this guy left, uh, the numbers came back up. Interesting concept, but one of the ways that if you do operate in an environment like that, when people come back from their mandatory vacation, zero base their access. Their roles go back to zero and they reestablish them. Now you're spreading out that work over the year, but you're allowed to ensure, therefore, that people are maintaining least privilege because that's one of our best practices. The minimum level of access required to perform your job functions. All of your job functions, but nothing more than that. And then do these periodic audits to ensure that these align with the current job and role assignments. The eighth thing I want to look at in terms of identity management is identity lifecycle management. We're really going to manage the user's journey through the organization from the time they're onboarded until the time they're offboarded. And that means maintaining and managing user access rights throughout that entire tenure. During onboarding, you introduce users to their organizational systems, give them the initial credentials, the access rights. As roles change or responsibilities grow or increase, access rights need to be adjusted. And then ultimately, when someone is offboarded, you need to re promptly revoke their access rights to prevent unauthorized access. Even a trusted individual. Sometimes you see organizations that say, hey, if you put in your two weeks notice, but you work in IT security, they say, here's your two weeks pay, goodbye today. And to a certain extent, I guess that the idea is that somebody in their last two weeks might not care about it, or they might be a little bit malicious. But the thought is, if someone really were malicious, why would they wait until after they said they're going to leave to do something malicious? I, I don't know. I'm not a malicious person, so maybe that's how people act. In any case, in a situation like that, I have heard also situations where somebody who understands what the HR policy would go to their boss and say, boss, theoretically speaking, if I were to give a two-week notice, you would have to let me go the same day, wouldn't you? Well, well why, yes. Well, theoretically speaking, wouldn't it be useful for somebody to share with their coworkers all of the tools and the techniques and the stuff that they're working on just in case they had to go ahead and depart on a short notice. You kind of see where I'm getting there. You haven't really said it, but you've said it. That, of course, requires a good working relationship there. And since you were theoretically speaking, you haven't put the boss in a bad trouble, but it allows you to then ensure that that individual provides a good, clean turnover. So we have automated workflows for onboarding, for offboarding, and then review these accesses on a periodic basis. You're hearing that a lot from me. I'd mentioned before, but the last item thing on identity management is a self-service, which allows users to handle things like a password reset. And self-service password reset, SSPR, Microsoft offers that. Takes a little bit of the burden off the help desk. You can do access requests, update profiles, etc. And now you don't have to go ahead and expend extra time and hours and people are going, oh, here we go, another password reset. This is boring. Reduces your downtime, improves your productivity. In addition, if you have a self-service portal where managers can indicate in advance what somebody is going to be doing, they can go ahead and say, hey, I've moved over here. Yes, you have. Here are your tools that you need to get there and keep your profile up to date, as I mentioned before. So users need training. They have to understand that to be able to use these self-service identity management tools and Make sure there's MFA enabled so that somebody doesn't go in there with a single credential, alter the access for somebody else, at which point they're locked out of their own system. As we've all heard horror stories about things like that. Now let's shift gears a little bit. We've talked about identity, but what about access? See, access management is the yin to identity management's yang. It's kind of the traffic cop for data. Now, up until now, we've been talking about managing identities, and you get the sense that correctly binding identity to a user or maybe a service principal is the first step toward being able to correctly assign access. A proper identity assignment should be non-negotiable. That's why we have a prohibition on credential sharing. Now, that extends to admins as well. If you use sudo to go ahead and do things as root instead of just logging in as root, you can now identify who it is that ran a particular set of privilege commands. 
Now, the first element of mature access management is defining access policies. And these are the rules that govern access to specific resources based upon roles, responsibilities, or other criteria. Operating systems have many of these policies built in by default. Want to find out? Try writing a text file to the C Windows directory. Unless you're administrator, that should not work. There are even system files that administrators can't alter while the operating system is running. And ensuring users may only do what they're supposed to do goes a long way in ensuring that the systems, as well as enterprises, run as intended. Now, the second element of access management is, well, access request management. That is, how do we handle user requests for access to resources, including approval workflows? And knowing that identities are assigned correctly is a necessary but not sufficient condition for effective IAM. We want to implement a process for a user to request access to additional resources from time to time, and that request should be reviewed and approved by appropriate authority. Inherent in this element is who have we made an appropriate authority? One of the frustrating things that I find as a CISO is when there are surprise assignments that are made by administrators who are in a hurry and just want to make the user happy. Ensure that you have a known process. Those responsible for approving access requests follow that process. And from time to time, maybe just take a regular user account and request some elevated privileges and see what happens. Now, the third element of access management is access certification. This involves regularly reviewing and validating user access rights to ensure they are appropriate. But a good place to start is with admin assignments. As I mentioned before, I do periodic audits of privileged accounts in my Azure environment. Now, Microsoft recommends no more than five global, ad global admins. That's not a whole lot, but it suggests we have to take some of those fine-grained access assignments so we can stick to the principle of least privilege. Microsoft has a lot of them. I think I count them at one point, but they could change, so I'm not even going to try to guess at this point. But as I mentioned before, one of my admins recently installed a tool for testing and evaluation. But I had my own alarm panel. It lit up when the service principal got global admin rights. Like, um, no. You might have really skilled admins who know their tenant inside and out, but they don't think like security professionals. It's not their fault. But you can use that opportunity to change the way they think about adding any additional identities, whether people or products, under your environment with elevated privileges. Now, next is access enforcement and monitoring. We want to implement mechanisms to enforce access policies, such as firewalls, application controls, as well as continuously track and log access to resources that detect anomalies or unauthorized access. I can't stress enough the importance of logs. The things that got Microsoft in trouble last year was a response to the federal government being hacked by a certain nation state operator. And Microsoft said, oh, well, you have to pay a premium to have access to your logs beyond a certain number of days. <clears throat> yeah, Congress was not amused. Uh, educational versions of Azure have a whopping seven days of logs. Now, maybe they've changed that last time I looked for the client. Uh, regular Azure had 30. One of the things you can consider is backing up your logs and keeping them for a lot longer period of time. Log storage is relatively cheap. And if you don't even have a SIM, then stick it in a Bitbucket and let it age gracefully for a couple of years. I don't know if you need anything that old, but I have had to do investigations where the events in question were more than six months old because potentially some bad actors are really low and slow. And the really best ones, a nation state actor, you may not know about it for a long time. Now, in that particular case, uh, Microsoft logs were all gone. But I was working with a third party that we had set up who were storing our logs for a much longer period of time and allowed me to go ahead and report with confidence to management whether or not that that threat actor was in our tenant causing mischief. By the way, it was false alarm. They were not in there. I could prove that, though. So it goes without saying that access provisioning, deprovisioning are the key elements of privilege or access with an enterprise, the logs to prove things, have role-based access definitions you can use quickly, and assign rights without error to an identity. Do you have a written policy that states who and under what circumstances a user can access a particular class of resources? What about deprovisioning? HR often knows long before IT does when a person is leaving an organization, but finding out at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon that a person is leaving that day shouldn't be cause for alarm if you have automated and validated deprovisioning mechanisms in place. Although I would agree, last minute alerts like that are kind of annoying, at least with the right preparation. They don't have to be a cause for frustration. Now, one other thing is think about what do you do when somebody needs temporary access? People go on vacation, they call in sick, they might be on temporary assignment. And when somebody else needs to fill in, you have a way to ensure that those access rights expire automatically at some point. Otherwise, you're faced with privilege creep. Now, there's a lot of different things that we can look at and go beyond, but I think at this particular point, I've probably 
bored you enough with all the details here, but hopefully with a few interesting stories in there, you're still stuck around. So let's look at kind of a review of the importance of effective IAM. It's clear it's a critical component of any robust cybersecurity strategy. If you effectively manage your user identities and your access rights, you protect your digital assets, helps you comply with regulatory requirements, and can enhance your operational efficiency. Remember, as cybersecurity professionals, you play a pivotal role in safeguarding your organization's digital environment. Understanding and implementing best practices in IAM will not only enhance your security posture, but also contribute to the overall success of your organization. So let's do a quick review before we wrap up. Elements of identity management, user registration. We collect and verify user information, create a unique profile. Identity proofing, verifying the authenticity of a user's claimed identity using documents, biometrics, or other methods. Directory services, you manage a central repository of user identities and their attributes. Identity federation, enable users to use a single identity across multiple systems and organizations. Credential issuance, generate and distribute credentials, such as passwords, smart cards, or digital certificates in a way that you know exactly who gets them. Identity synchronization, ensuring that identity information is consistent across multiple platforms and directories. Profile management, allowing users to update their personal information and preferences, but not necessarily their access rights. Role management, defining and maintaining roles that group users with similar access needs so that assignment of people to particular jobs goes very quickly. And when you deprovision somebody, you know exactly what they're coming out. Identity lifecycle management, you want to manage identities throughout their entire life cycle from creation to deactivation and self-service identity management, provide users with tools to manage their own identity information and credentials. And essentially on access management, we talked about access policy definition, having rules and policies to govern access, access request management to handle user requests for access to resources, including an approval workflow, access certification to regularly review and validate user access rights to ensure they're appropriate, access enforcement, to implement mechanisms to enforce access policies, such as firewalls or application controls. Access monitoring, continually track and log access to resources to detect anomalies or unauthorized access. And access provisioning, giving access to resources based upon these approved access and requests, as well as the deprovisioning, which means when we back somebody out of an organization, out of a role, we can go ahead and remove that. And of course, the temporary access management, which is if somebody has a role assignment for a short period of time, we have I'm bound access that will automatically expire so nobody has to remember to click on it because people forget. And if we do all that and we effectively segregate duties, such as there's no one person that is going to go ahead and be a potential cause for catastrophic error, people do make mistakes, mistakes, people go bad. But if you have two person control or somebody getting a chance to review it, you're much more likely to catch that. Well, wow. well, I thank you for joining us on a journey through IAM. If you found this episode valuable, share it with your colleagues and peers. We'll find out that uh, we got a lot of information here at CISO Tradecraft, and we're looking at adding more information for you. So if you stuck into this long, then recognize that you're going to go ahead and think about what we might be able to offer you beyond just the podcast. I think you'll find out that you get some really good information. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. This is your host, G. Mark Hardy, and until next week, Stay safe.